class, this is session two of week three, September the 9th, 2019, of Introduction to Graduate Research for Asian Christian University, session two of week three. And this particular session, according to your syllabus, is entitled The Knowledge Explosion of the Modern Era. Are you ready for it? Are you ready for it? That's my question. Suppose someone asks you, do you think God exists? What will you say in reply? Yes, I believe so. Suppose someone wants to know the difference between belief and knowledge and wonders if there is such a difference. Can you give an adequate answer? Suppose someone says, I think that science has disproven the creation myth, as they may call it, in the book of Genesis. But you are a preacher of the Bible. Do you believe that Genesis is actually true? How do you answer? What do you say? Oh, yes, I believe it's true, you may argue. But then, what are your reasons? How do you provide evidence? Why? The friend who asks you the question should also accept the belief in Genesis as a true account of the origin of the universe and of mankind, rather than the theories of modern science, which is antithetical often to Christian faith. Are you ready? Can you give an answer? If someone asks you, do you think that uh, people who have preference for those of the same sex in terms of homoerotic behavior, homosexuals that is, do you think they have the right to get married and to maintain a family just as heterosexual couples have traditionally done? How do you answer? You probably will say, oh no, I think that would be wrong. That's contrary to the will of God. And then if they challenge you, well, how do you establish in your mind what God's will is on any matter? How do you answer? How do you answer? Are you prepared? Are we ready to answer? In a previous session, I indicated that I had been offered an opportunity early in life, once graduating from secondary school, that is from high school. I, after the 12th grade of all of my previous studies, to go to a preacher's school in the Atlanta, Georgia area. One of my relatives was a professor in that school, but he advised me against the idea of enrolling in that school. At first, I was surprised. I wondered, why, brother, don't you think I need to go and learn the Bible in an intensive fashion? He said, yes, of course you do, but you need to also know about a number of other things you may not learn in a preacher school program as such. You need to learn about the humanities, about science. You need to take courses in biology. You need to learn about history. Know some things about world civilization. Be familiar with the classics of Greece and Rome, somewhat. Know about literature that's been written in English both in Great Britain as well as in the United States, the country from which I held. You need to know those things. You need to be familiar with general knowledge so that you will have a fuller understanding of the time in which you live in order to be able to give an answer to those who ask you of the reason of the hope that is in you. I'll be frank and admit that all of my interest in graduate work has been in the area of apologetics. Now, I know there are other valuable things to be studied in graduate schools. But in my estimation, the most important thing we can do is to pursue Christian apologetics, the defense of the faith. A number of years ago, I wrote my doctoral dissertation along these lines at Erskine Seminary in South Carolina. That is for the DMIN degree. I have since then published that in book form. It's called, uh, the book's called Training Manual for Cultural Combat. I think I've shared this with you in the past, and I will remind you that it is available through, well, it has been available through Advantage Books in the state of Florida, in the United States. I'm not sure if at the moment it's possible to order any copies. I'll try to make that possible in the future. But in this work, I have found a number of items that correspond to the lecture that I, in fact, have set up for us today, where I talk about the knowledge explosion. And in the beginning when I ask, are we combat ready, because again, this is training manual for cultural combat, or social cultural warfare, we could say, the moral war of our era. Uh, in the beginning of this, I ask about cultural literacy and homiletics. Literacy has to do with one's educational level in a given area. Cultural literacy. How educated are we about our own culture? You know, our culture is not the same today as it was in the past. I would suppose, though I've never visited your fair country of the Philippines, that 
things are very different today in this year than your grandparents uh, would have experienced in your homeland uh, back, uh, say, in the early part of the 20th century or in the middle part of the 20th century. And, and expectations and beliefs and, and values have changed. Young people probably don't think or even speak or even dress in the same way or have the same hopes and aspirations that they did two or three generations ago. That's true, I guess, just about in any culture. Things are constantly changing. I know it's true in my culture. So although I wrote this in mind uh, with, with this culture in mind, the United States, and also work I'd been doing in the Marxist culture of Cuba, on the island of Cuba in the Caribbean, because I'd been doing mission work there at the time and training preachers, uh, I nevertheless think it's adaptable to our situation, to your situation, wherever you may be found, in the Philippines or in whichever country you may be doing the Lord's work. First of all, I want to remind us that we, like the apostles of old, should be prepared to give a defense. You know, 1 Peter 3.15 commands us to be ready. To be ready always to give an answer to every man who asks us a reason of the hope that is in us with meekness and fear. Again, that's our mandate for doing apologetics, to give a reason. And literally this in the Greek would mean to give a reasoned defense, an apologia in the Greek, a reasoned defense of what we believe. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians 1 verse 16 that he was set for the defense of the gospel. He was set for the defense of the gospel. And others should know that. What are you, are you saying, Paul? I'm saying I'm always ready to... Give a defense when required. If someone challenges the gospel, I'm ready to give an answer to that challenge. He looked at his work as a kind of spiritual warfare. Not carnal, but spiritual. He says in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 5 that his work was to be destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And I'm pretty sure that's from the New American Standard Bible version. Paul's life itself, his ministry, constituted the good fight of faith. As he told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 7, he had fought a good fight. And his protege, Timothy himself, also was to learn to fight the good fight. 1 Timothy 6.12, not a literal fight, not a physical fight, but rather an intellectual fight, a spiritual fight, spiritual warfare, spiritual combat. The Apostle also reminds us in Ephesians 6 and verse 12 that we are to struggle against the rulers and the powers and the world forces of this darkness, which are also associated with spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So, my brothers, we can see that such passages tell us we have to be prepared. And I think that's one of the reasons why you have elected to be a part of a, a school of study and a formal program in which you can learn more about the Bible. And now why you're pursuing graduate studies. And I commend you for that. And I hope that we help you accomplish your goal of preparing yourself more and more to be able to understand the times in which we live in order for you to articulate the right kind of answer to the questions that are being raised today. You know, it's one thing to be well-trained in issues of a bygone era of the past. And you can read a lot of books that were printed in the middle of the 19th century and be pretty well able to answer the false teachings of the 19th century. But unless those are the same teachings we face today, and many of them are in recirculated form, but unless they are, it's really kind of irrelevant. You need to know, and I need to know, how to give an answer to people who live today. Those with whom we are working today, how to show them what God's Word says and how it is applicable to the situations in which they find themselves today. A few years ago, an author by the name of David A. Noble, his last name is spelled N as in November, O-E-B as in boy, E-L, Noble, David Noble. He, he published a set of seminal uh, pages that were called at the time, Understanding the Times. Understanding the Times. It was a very thick book. Now, I don't have a copy, but I used to borrow a copy that my brother, who is also a gospel preacher in our area, used to let me borrow. He has a copy. Uh, this book title was taken from the book of First Chronicles, chapter 12, verse 32. This speaks of the 200 counselors of Issachar, the tribe of Issachar, men who understood the times with knowledge of what Israel should do. Again, men who understood the times, understood the times 
with knowledge of what Israel should do. We can take that principle and apply it to us today, brothers. We should understand our times. We should know about the cultural milieu in which we find ourselves. Noble had written, We believe that a comprehensive knowledge of the Christian worldview and its rivals will provide today's young people the understanding necessary to become Christian leaders. And I want to emphasize what Dr. Noble had written. And I agree with him. It is necessary for us to be trained in what the Scriptures teach as well as to understand ideas that circulate around us. Even erroneous, false ideas, sometimes bizarre and perverse ideas. We need to have some familiarity with those ideas in order to recognize them when they arise, when someone articulates those ideas with whom we are studying, for example, or to whom we are preaching, and to be able to formulate our response to those ideas in order to help change minds, to cast down imaginations, King James Version, 2 Timothy 3, or 10, rather, 3 to 5. And every high thing which exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We must, therefore, be well prepared. We must be better prepared than our counterparts. My goal would be to have you men to be as well trained as you possibly can be. To be not only as well trained as your counterparts who are out there in the denominational world preaching, who are preaching in sectarian bodies, bodies that are not New Testament Christian bodies. My goal is not only to see you as well prepared, but even better prepared. Better prepared. So that you'll be able to give a, a better, more satisfactory answer to those who ask questions. And you will be able, if necessary, even to refute or to confound the false ideas that are being promoted by so many people in our world today, whether they come from secular science or whether they come from perverse moral uh, um, studies uh, and ideas that are promoted in our universities or whether they come from sectarian denominational preachers or whether they come just from those who are indifferent to the gospel. We need to know. We have the task then of understanding our times. We need to know about, as one has written, the national trends and local folkways. You need to understand your national trends and the local folkways where you find yourself preaching the gospel and doing mission work. I don't think we can be as effective as we ought to be as gospel preachers, as evangelists, unless we know what's going on. And this is one of the reasons for graduate work. It was one of the major emphasis in our studies at Erskine Seminary, and for that I'm thankful to have had that experience back in the late 1990s, to study about what's going on in our culture around us. And at the time I focused predominantly on a phenomenon that was called, and still is called, postmodernism, and discussed some of the characteristics, uh, the major characteristics of that movement, that attitude, that mood that still in some places pervades the thinking of many people, even though the term may not be as commonly used today as it was 15 or 20 years ago. Nevertheless, the ideas are around, and it was my privilege to study some of them, and I hope you also will do that. Jesus had asked in Matthew 16 and verse 3, though the context, of course, was slightly different from what I have in mind here, do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky but cannot discern the signs of the times? Brothers, can we discern the signs of the times? I hope in this series of studies in which you are about to begin, and this is one of the introductory courses to that, this introduction to graduate research, that you will be prepared to know what's going on in our world and to give an adequate defense. Knowing the time, Paul says in Romans 13 and verse 11, knowing the time. We are to be people who are knowing the time. Paul himself is a good example of what I have in mind, my brothers. A man who knew the Scriptures thoroughly, of course. Of course, he was guided by the Spirit as well. But the man Paul, even apart from his inspiration, was a well-prepared instrument that God used. In the hands of God, he was a very effective missionary to the ancient world. Paul had been trained in rabbinic studies. Not only did he know the old Bible, the Hebrew Bible, but he also understood many secular authors. He was able freely to quote from Greek philosophers and Greek poets, as we see manifested in Acts chapter 17, when he gave his apology or his defense at Mars Hill, the Areopagus. So Paul had a very general preparation, as well as a specific preparation. His general preparation was in the humanities, you might say, knowledge of the Greco-Roman world and its culture. 
and of course specifically in a study of the Hebrew Bible. We are then to be ready always to give an answer. And so we have to have both general and special preparation to do that. We must develop certain skills that many of us maybe don't quite have as we need uh, at this time. Because many people agree that we are facing unusual circumstances in our work of evangelism today that our forefathers did not necessarily face or not in the same way. We are living at a kind of turning point in history. Some have even said we are preaching between times, between what could be called the old modern era. <laughs> that sounds strange to call it old, but to speak of the era that is now receding into the past and the newer postmodern era. Western civilization, about which I have some knowledge, and which affects all of us, I would say even in your culture, Western civilization is a predominant influence. It's undergoing a process of metamorphosis, of tremendous upheaval at this time. In fact, some have even said a new civilization is arising. A brand new type of civilization. There are many names that are given to it. Some have called it call it the Davos culture. Uh, uh, others have just called it the postmodern era. And there are many ways of looking at the new consensus that is arising, which is, in essence, very harmful to Christian belief, which is contrary to Christian belief in many respects. It's very secularized now, heavily influenced by Darwinian evolution and all the consequences, the logical upshots that follow from such theories heavily influenced by uh, the, the theories of Karl Marx and later of Lenin and uh, even Stalin, uh, as those ideas have been adapted and disseminated in many parts of the world. We need to understand then the intellectual background to which we are preaching, as well as the sociological background. If we have opportunity, we can study more about the influence of technology itself on culture. And, and I'm not an expert in this matter. Much has been published about it. And all of us can see it on a day-to-day -day basis. Kids today, younger people today, are almost all glued to their telephones. <laughs> now, that's an obvious thing. They're glued to their telephones. And just about every moment of every day, they're pecking along and sending texts and receiving texts and sending videos and sending images and receiving images, talking to friends, rarely talking, most of the time texting. And, and it's, di it's difficult often to carry on a conversation with a younger person that we call from the millennial generation, for example, uh, because they're almost always enamored with their devices and they don't want to interact with people on a personal level. Now, that simple fact, the telephone, and it's the ubiquitous nature of telephones, uh, of smartphones, that simple fact is, is the kind of the epitome of what's going on in terms of technological changes that are also creating um, sociological changes in our time. We need to know about things in general. We need to know about what people around us are, are holding to in their minds, what they believe, what they think. Some have said the information age is now upon us, the information age. We are literally deluged, swamped with information, deluged by it. We are inundated, flooded by information. Right here at your fingertips is the computer, no doubt. And with a simple click of the keyboard, you are able to go out and find tons and tons of information on almost any subject conceivable. In fact, we are almost drowning with information. And there may be a legitimate distinction between information as such, raw data, and knowledge adequate knowledge, and especially useful knowledge or practical knowledge. Since there is so much out there, we could not possibly know it in a given lifetime. We're individuals, and our lives are just not long enough for us to learn everything there is to know. Since that is the case, we have to pick and to choose which we most need to learn, which is most important for us to be able to give an answer to others about the reason of the hope, the faith in Christ, that is in us and to persuade others to accept that as well, to help them to work through doctor, doctrinal difficulties, to work through doubts and, and uh, fears that they may have, to allay those fears by proper sound teaching. We have to learn what is useful as opposed to all that's out there. We simply cannot know it all. Back in the late 1960s, 
One of my favorite educators that I knew at the time was Dr. Rex A. Turner, Sr. I mentioned in the last session his son, uh, Dr. Rex Turner, Jr., who had the dream of establishing the Ph.D. program at Amridge. Well, his father was actually one of the founders of the school itself, Rex A. Turner, Sr. It's my privilege to sit at his feet and to take a number of courses and to know him well uh, back in his lifetime, back in the 20th century. He wrote at that time that the preacher and the educator... Um, must learn about rapid revolutionary changes that are taking place. Now that's what he said in the 60s, and how much more we could say are such rapid changes taking place today. These changes have implications for our brotherhood, and they have implications for preachers in particular. I think Dr. Turner had, as it were, been visionary. Not that he was a true prophet, but he had foreseen what was coming, the knowledge explosion. Uh, in the 1960s, according to the thinker, Os Guinness, uh, we have a revolution that were just as far sweeping in terms of changing my nation as was our own so-called civil war and then later on in the 1930s, the Great Depression. I say so-called civil war because the vo those of us who live in the southeast considered a war of southern independence, a separate nation, uh, the Confederacy, fighting uh, another nation, the Union, but that's another story and that's not relevant to uh, what we're reading here. Uh, Dr. Turner at the time said humanity's great fund of collective knowledge had actually doubled in the period from 1960 to 1967. <laughs> well, we, we chuckle at that. 1960 to 1967. Now, this, of course, was the age of great accomplishments in terms of technology. We sent a man to the moon roughly at that period of time, or we're about to do so. The following year, in 68, we made preparations for the moonshot and all the work that had to be done in space prior to that. Much was learned uh, between those years, those seven years. And man's storehouse of all knowledge combined was doubled. Well, how much more since then? Um, he also noted at the time that some were predicting a 2,000-fold increase in man's storehouse of knowledge from that time until the end of the century, until the year 2000. Again, from 1967 up until 2000, it was thought man's collective knowledge would, would, would be multiplied 2,000 times over at least. Well, we are now almost 20 years into the 21st century. How much more? has information just exploded all around us. And data is available everywhere. So it is not possible for any one individual in his short lifetime to master it all. You know, we talk about earning a master's degree and earning a doctor's degree. When I was younger, I used to have the misconception that a man with a doctor's degree must be an expert in his field. He must know virtually all there is to know about his particular subject matter that he studied at the doctoral level. I used to think that. I used to hope that when I had to go visit the physician. We call them doctors here. They usually have their MDs, their medical doctor's degrees in this country. And as I would go to see the physician and find out what was ailing me, I, I had hoped that he or she would know all there is to know about medicine, all there is to know about the human body and about infirmities that can possibly come our way, all about medicine and bacteriology and any such items that would be necessary to help him or her diagnose my problem and to give the proper treatment. Well, unfortunately, as I've gotten older, I realize that's just not, not realistic. It's not possible even for a professional such as a medical doctor to master it all, to know all there is to know about medicine. This is why many of them have to specialize in certain narrow areas of the field of medicine. So you go to eye doctors, and you go to dentists, and you go uh, to podiatrists, and you go uh, to oncologists, and all kinds of different doctors because they can't learn it all in one lifetime. Well, neither can we. Neither can we. As I've said in the past, I'll remind us, when we study an additional four years, for example, beyond the baccalaureate degree, the bachelor's degree, go four years for the bachelor's degree, and then an additional four years to get a doctor's degree as a rule, or maybe even longer, we're simply spending an arbitrary amount of time in a classroom. Why, why eight years? Why not 18? Why not 28? Why not three? 
Why not 15 and a half years? What is there about the number eight, eight years, or the number four for four years of graduate work that makes it a magic number? And that once you finish the four years, you suddenly know it all. Well, of course, you don't. Suppose you spend an additional four years. You still wouldn't know it all. You could not keep up with it all. We're doing the best we can with what we have, and you have to stop somewhere with your formal studies. You can't study all of your life and be in school. where well, you can study all of your life privately, but to be in school all of your life is not realistic and should not be what we expect of our gospel preachers in particular. But we do need to take advantage of the opportunity that we have before us in our graduate work. Today, knowledge is power. Information is power, writes the analyst George Barna. We're living in a day, age of information, and we trade with information as once our forefathers traded with currency or traded with money. There are many biblical considerations, too, about why we should know more and be prepared for the knowledge explosion. The Apostle Peter writes in 2 Peter 3 and verse 18, We as Christians are to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, we are to grow in grace and knowledge. We are to grow in knowledge, therefore, as well as grace. Grow in knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This means we need to study. 2 Timothy 2.15, King James, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, a better English translation of that might be to give diligence rather than to use the word study, but it means to make a studied effort, as we say, to get diligence in your effort to know the Word of God, to be one who can handle right the Word of God. This requires study in the usual sense. Colossians 3 and verse 10 is where Paul writes of the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of one who created him. And this is why he could say in Romans 12 and verse 2, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what that will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So we are to discern the truth from the error, to know the will of God and how it's applicable to the issues of our time. Thus we should know the issues of our time. The culture war rages. The culture war has to do with the battle for values. The battle for morality itself that we're fighting in the West, in Western civilization, that no doubt you also are confronting in your own culture in the Philippines. It's hard to get away from the monolithic culture of the West in, in terms of the transfer of information that comes through videos, YouTube, Facebook, the cinema, movies, Hollywood that has influenced many times very adversely much of the world around us. We've got to be prepared. Are you ready to give an answer? Well, one of the ways to be prepared is to continue to go to school until you've learned enough about some basic matters that you can be fairly well adept at giving answers. Let, let me give you an example of a basic matter I have in mind. It might not have been possible for you my friend and student, to have learned much about the Greek language at the undergraduate level. Now, perhaps you did. Perhaps all of you did. And I will rejoice to learn that you did to gain a reading, working knowledge of the Greek. But here at the graduate level, uh, that will be more of a, an expectation for you and more an opportunity now. You have more time in a classroom setting to be able to, to learn these things and they can be of great value, especially if you're getting into a, a, a very kind discussion with someone about the difference between churches of Christ and denominationalists in terms of the mode of baptism. You will explain baptism in the Bible is immersion. How do you know it's immersion? Well, that's what the Greek word means. How do you know that? Well, you'll have some understanding of that. You'll have ability to uh, go and look at the grammar in the Greek, to understand the vocabulary, to look at uh, the concordances that give the information behind the meaning of words. And, and many such things is that. That's just one simple example that you'll be better prepared to do by spending more time in graduate work. You will learn more about other subjects, and I hope more about 
hermeneutics, the, the study of, of interpretation, the science of interpretation. You'll learn more about church history if you have opportunity to get a better understanding of where the denominational world came from that's all around us, where the Catholic world came from, how Roman Catholicism arose and what its uh, problems are today, its severe problems. You will have a, a better understanding of the secular sciences, hopefully. Now, it may not be... Uh, an opportunity for you here at this level at this graduate school to take advanced courses in biology for example but hopefully in the course of your studies you will learn enough about the biblical account of creation to spur your interest in that area so that you will do scientific research and learn more science and be better prepared to, 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 to learn those things and, and to acquire the skills necessary to do research independent original research on your own so that you can make a valuable contribution in this area. We need more men who are well prepared, who know the Word of God and who know people, who know their fellow men and who know the society, the culture in which they live, the country where they find themselves, the region of the world where they are working. We need more prepared to do that. That's why then we have graduate studies available. And hopefully, you will be able to avail yourself of this opportunity and learn as much as you possibly can. Again, as we will see, there are potential dangers with learning anything, but in particular with learning about religious studies. There are some dangers. How could that be, you wonder? Well, we will see. Some of the obvious ones have to do with being led astray. Another one has to do with simply the arrogance that can come upon us if we're not careful from our much learning. Those who learn a lot sometimes are aware of the fact they know a great deal more about certain subjects than their peers. And there, there is a tendency if one is not careful to use that and to flex one in intellectual muscle. To flex your muscles intellectually in such a way that you intimidate others and you look down upon others. That's wrong. We'll talk about that too. We'll talk about that in future studies as we warn about potential dangers. But let's look at the positive side, the opportunity you have now to prepare yourself. I would love to see an army of very well-prepared graduates of this school, a virtual army to be sent out into the field of battle, spiritual battle well prepared, who will remain true to their Lord, true to the faith once given to the saints, Jude 3, who will not falter, not fall away, who will not run in battle, who will remain courageous and steadfast and loyal to their captain, Jesus Christ, who is King of kings and Lord of lords. My prayer is to see that kind of program developed among you. May God bless you and help you to be ready for the knowledge explosion.